Welcome to the Answers Yes podcast, where we interview some of the most interesting people that have said yes to opportunities in their life. We hope that through these stories, you can learn to create your own destiny by saying yes along the way. Join us as we explore the new series covering topics such as passion, integrity, and hard work. I'm your host, Jim Riley, and I hope you enjoy these interviews as much as I do. I believe that everyone has an important message worth hearing. Hello and welcome back to the show. You know, if you've been listening to me for a while, you know that I spent a number of years with David Meltzer as my business coach and then eventually became friends and, you know, he coached me off and and running to Montana and pursuing my businesses. But one of the things that I learned from him was a, a line that I say often, and that is, I paid the dummy tax so you don't have to. And that, that, you know, I use that in my consulting and coaching and some of my, my business discussions. But I love today's guest. He is, the highlight is professional failure. And I've got Justin Skinner on the line. How are you doing? Good. How are you, Jim? Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, I'm doing great. And it's my pleasure to have you. Nothing like just calling it out there, right? Like I've paid the dummy tax. <laughs> I'm professional yep. failure. How can I help you now? Exactly. No, I love it. And that's the, I talk about in the book too, but the mentors, and I love how you refer to it as the dummy tax, because to me, I don't want to have to pay that again. I would rather uh, glean from someone else's uh, experience and let them pay it. And then I'll just, I'll learn from it and skip those. So I'm, I'm all for that. I don't know if I've heard the dummy tax thing before, but I wrote that down. I'm going to use that going forward. <laughs> I, I got to give David Meltzer credit for that, you know, but um, it, it's just interesting. It baffles me as much as we can help people and tell them our stories of failure and, and you know, the pitfalls that we've been through. Sometimes we just, we get too arrogant and we don't listen, do we? Correct. Yeah. And I think humility is a big part of that too, because uh, if it doesn't matter if you're 80 or you're eight years old, if someone gives you a a nugget of wisdom or say, you know, don't do this, it it does take an ounce of humility to say, okay, you're right. uh, I'm not going to do that. Instead of going forward and saying, well, I'm different. This is different. Uh, It definitely takes, takes humility to work through that. Yeah. You know, I've got a little bit more time on my hands, or at least I should say my focus is different now. And I have the ability to read through a lot of books, you know, old books talking about business and successes and failures. And, you know, a lot of those lines that felt like cliches when I was in my 20s, they're true. Like, really, I should have paid attention back in my 20s. I feel the same way. You know, (laughs) Um, look, I I always ask my guests to take us back in time, you know, where things started for them, how you uh, started off in business or college or whatever it was that you felt was a transitionary period in your life. And maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and, and let's dig into what you're doing now eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I'll kind of give the short version. So I grew up, both my grandparents were dairy farmers in, in Missouri. So I grew up on the farm, uh, definitely learned how to work hard from a young age, and then also realized that I didn't want to do uh, farming life my my whole life just because I saw, you know, my grandpa putting in 100, 120 hours a week, it felt like. Uh, but anyway, I learned hard work there and then wound up playing sports and uh, baseball through high school and college. And uh, through one turn or another, I thought I was going to do professional baseball. It didn't work out and it led to um, a business career. And I, I wound up working, I think the first four or five years to work for a couple of different companies. And then um, kind of the the moment I think that things shifted for us was I got a call on a Monday morning and I had been working for a publishing company. And they just said, hey, Justin, uh, just want to let you know, we don't think things are working out. We're going to let you go. And I was a little blindsided by that, um, but that was the moment where I turned back and and I I kind of leaned back in my chair and I called my wife in and I said, hey, uh, I just got fired, um, but I'm not worried. Uh, we're going to go out and we're going to find a space. So uh, we really did. We we said we said yes to to ourselves and betting on ourselves. And we went out and we found a, a space that day and we wound up negotiating with the uh, with the owner of the building and we um really haven't looked back since. And there were there were months where we thought to ourselves, what in the heck are we doing? And you know, we'd be in the red or we wouldn't know where the next paycheck or project or client is coming from, but we kind of just kept our heads down and and worked together and um just you know prayed that we'd we'd have the right doors open. So uh, that's kind of the the short end of it. And then it's led to so many different opportunities. And I definitely know that that was a pivotal moment working for ourselves. It's led to the book, the the podcast I do, real estate investing, just so many things that have come from that. So really um, fortunate to to have had that firing in my life. 
Justin, yesterday I, I taught my first class at a local high school. It's on um, entrepreneurship and business leadership. And one of the exercise was uh, to, you know, ask the students, you know, what they do, where they live, you know, um, and of course they're in ninth through 12th grade in, in this high school. What was interesting to me and up here in Montana, a number of them are farmers and mm. their goals at the bottom are their dreams at the bottom of the page. None of it related to farming, right? It, it was all something else, just like your story. But what I would love to hear from you is how that hard work on that dairy farm translated into some of your success. Because I think oftentimes we dismiss the work that we're doing and the labor that we're putting in thinking it doesn't matter, but really it does, as you've shown. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Jim. And, and for me, I 100% believe, and I know I wrote about this in the book, a lot of the analogies I use now in business uh, relate back to farming. But I believe that the the most important thing for me growing up on a farm was almost that long-term mindset and almost that planting of seeds. I don't have to have success day one in order for me to be behind something and, and put in hard work. So I really do think that helped tremendously in business because there were moments and months where we were working and we were doing things and we did not see the fruits of any of our, our labor. But then after time, just like a season, you, you plant a seed in farming. And then, you know, months later through hard work and water, you start to see a fruit, same thing in business. And that's kind of the mindset that I carried over in business. And my wife's the same way. Uh, we, I feel like we can really nail down and know that the fruit is coming later. The harvest is coming later. And as long as we're consistent and we work hard and we do the right things, um, we have a very good chance of a harvest. And, and then again, uh, my uncle actually, I mean, we, we still live on the farm. So my uncle just had a, a crop of corn that, it was really hot here and he did everything he could and everything that he thought was right. And he lost probably half or two thirds of, of the crop. And I think that's another mindset of sometimes it's just a failure out of your control or some things you can do completely right. And it just doesn't work out. So definitely if I'm bringing something from the farming world, it's that long-term mindset of uh, planting and then taking care of what we've been giving. And then the harvest will come later. Such a great metaphor. And by the way, I'm sure your uncle will plant corn again next year. He's probably not going to give up and walk away and go, well, that Correct. didn't work out, you know? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. He'll just keep going. And, and I, they rotate uh, crops. And I think next year they may plant alfalfa. But I was talking to him and he said, this was the first time I think in 40 or 50 years that it's happened. Mm -hmm. So it happens, you know, maybe twice, twice a century. Uh, when it happens, it sucks, especially now that corn prices are through the roof. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, hopefully he'll learn from it and next year he'll he'll do it a little better and the turnout will be different. But again, sometimes there's just things we rely on nature and God and hope that hope that they work out. Yeah, it, it's funny. You know, we have a pretty good sized garden on my ranch out here and my wife, she's out there every day. It's her little, you know, it's her project. She loves it. But, you know, when I think back to June and we had a, a very wet and cold, even some snow in June up here. And she was getting ready to plant seeds and she had to plant them inside the greenhouse and then transfer them. And you know, those seeds are so small. And then, and then you just, you take care of them every day. You brush off, the, you know, the weeds and, and you toil the dirt and you just hope that those little seeds turn into something. And I'm looking out at the garden right now and she has these massive watermelons and cantaloupes and zucchinis. And, uh, you know, business is so much the same as that. We have to do the little things for a long period of time. Then all of a sudden, you, you know, it's that tipping point, right? Things start to take off. Exactly. Yeah. And I love that example of a garden. I, I really, I was thinking the other day that, uh, you know, if someone were to ask me for, for business advice or investing advice, the first thing I would tell them to do is go plant your own garden and understand how that works. Exactly what you're saying, because it's a lot of work in the beginning. And a lot of times you think, man, what is even going to come of this? I'm just wasting my time. And then it starts happening and it starts growing and then it compounds and then your plants get ridiculously big and then you have too much produce. Um, I just think it's a great lesson to carry over in life and business. So if I were to pass along any information, you know, to anyone looking to start, uh, go out and plant a garden and go through that for a season and then, and then take that and carry that into your next venture. I love that advice. Now in your story, you talked about, you know, getting laid off. And your first call to your wife was, I'm not worried. We got this, right? Tell me about that because it happens, you know? It, it happens and, and people yeah. can go the opposite direction and turn it immediately into worry. Sounds like you've got faith in your life too, but what was it that, that gave you that confidence? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I I truly believe looking back that it was people around me that believed in me, that encouraged me because it is a moment of failure where I could have sat back and be like, man, I'm worthless. I just got fired. This is the second time I've been fired. I don't know what I'm doing uh, right or what I'm doing wrong. But instead, I, I know I drew from past encouragement. I drew from belief in, you know, what we were doing. I, like I said, I bet on ourselves. And and then again, my wife was right there next to me. And she actually, funny enough, we went from two incomes to zero within a month because she had just quit her job. Um, we had been doing some stock photography and things on the side. And we basically said, once you, once you cover your uh, paycheck with stock photography, you can quit. So she quits a month earlier. I get fired a month later. We go from, we had just bought a house. We go from two incomes, pretty comfortable to now we are really betting on ourselves. So um, all in all, I think the people around me made a big difference. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, my own will or grit. I think people really did help me build that willpower and grit. And I just, uh, at the end of the day, believe that what we were doing, we could be successful. And uh, I just, I can never underestimate the the quality of people around me that pour into me. So I just go back to a large part of that was mentors and, and family and friends around us that believed in us. What was it that they said or did to give you that belief? Because I, you know, look, we all have big or small support systems, you know, family and hopefully friends are very supportive of things that we do, but oftentimes we don't listen to them because we get so discouraged about our own current circumstances. What was it that they said or did that really made you feel like, Hey, I got this. Yeah. Maybe it was more or less what they didn't say. Um, when, when you'd have, you know, an idea like, Hey, we're going to do this. Uh, instead of saying, oh, are you sure you want to do that? Or is that the the wisest thing to do? I think it was it was mostly things left unsaid, like in body language um, in full support. So while they were at the same time, like, you know, we believe you guys can do this. You guys are going to be fine. All that helped a lot. But I think it was it even came down to the the little nonverbal cues where we really felt like they believed in what we were doing and believed that we could definitely succeed. Yeah, I, I appreciate that and your honesty because oftentimes I think people get stuck in their own way and they don't listen or see the signs around them like, hey, you really can yeah. do this and we want you to and we want to encourage you and be there for you because uh, I believe that people really want to help others succeed. So you get you get off and running. Uh, did, you know, did you build a business plan or did you just wing it or, you know, how did you guys get rolling? Because, uh, when you get laid off, everything comes fast and furious from that point, especially when you need a paycheck. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually, we actually got a loan. So we had a business plan. I took it to a bank and this was, we had actually signed the lease before we had the business plan. Um, so funny enough, we signed the lease or we're going to figure it out. We basically had a month to fix up this space during that month. We were forming a business plan based on stock photography and clients. And we took it to a bank and said, Hey, we want a $10,000 loan to, to buy commercial photography equipment, deck out a studio. And we got rejected two or three times through that. And so that was another part of just working through the failure. Um, and then finally we came to a bank and said, Hey, uh, that's fine, but you don't have any income right now. So if your dad will sign, then we'll give you the loan. So I went to my dad and he was fine with it. And he actually uh, helped us get that first loan. He was just a second co-signer. And funny enough, we wound up paying that loan off in, I don't know, six months. It didn't take long at all. But I think just having that that person that believed in us and really my dad put his name on the dotted line saying that I believe in what you're doing. I believe you're going you're gonna to pay this back. I'm not on the hook for this. Um, so that was part of it. But then, yeah, early on, it wasn't easy. I know, uh, I think it was a good lesson for me because the first three months, we just grinded and grinded. And I felt like we were working 70, 80 hours, 80 hours a week. And uh, we really didn't have much to show for it. And we, my wife and I actually just started praying for doors to be open and um, clients to come through. And we actually, one day, um, I felt like maybe that week we weren't working as hard. Uh, and we had probably our biggest client um, that we ever had at the the agency uh, walk in the front door and say, Hey, I just had a designer leave. I know you're here now. Uh, I'd love to sit down and talk. And so it was just a good lesson for me that sometimes things are, are out of my hands and I can work 120 hours a week or I can work 10 and you have the right relationship and it makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it sounds like you were prepared for that person to walk through that door oftentimes they think we get caught off guard and, and maybe we miss the opportunities. 
Yes, I think that's a great point. The the prepared, and that's something I do now. It's something I did in sports, uh, and it it almost puts me at ease. If you can be prepared at something and be prepared for opportunity, uh, then you're ready to take those opportunities. But there's been times in my past where you have an opportunity and you just don't see it because I'm not ready to go. But I think that's a major major part of it is being prepared, being prepared for the things that might come that that you can't see. Um, but again, you, you go back, you can be prepared in so many different ways. You can be prepared by reading or building skills or anything. And sometimes again, we go back to, uh, does this make sense? Am I wasting my time? Um, but if you're prepared, I think you'll, you'll be really, um, surprised at the amount of doors that open for you. I know you're from Missouri and, uh, I'm a huge fan of Andy Frisella with First Form, and and uh, yeah. you know I was thinking about his story living in the back of his uh, supplement superstore on a on a bed that they found at a garage sale or something like that. But you know he talks about coming in front where the customer engagement is and always giving it a hundred percent and and delivering on that. You know the we talk about that preparedness. Um, what was it like after you secured that that biggest customer that walked through the door after you sat down with them? What did that feel like? And it felt like uh, all the work we had put into it uh, to that point was worth it. And then also that we could do this. It was just another little um, oomph of motivation that we can actually do this. Because when you're when you're going a couple months, you do have um, you know doubts that creep into your mind where it says, you know, am I cut out for this? Is this what we were supposed to do? So you're always kind of playing ping pong back and forth in your mind. So I think it was definitely a good moment where. Uh, you, we started seeing some of the fruits of our labor and being prepared, and uh, it was it was a critical moment for us. Yeah, appreciate that. I'm just looking at some of your notes over here, my other screen. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, you bring up some great topics, and and I want to dig into a little bit of the, you know about the book and and things like. Um, you know, how can someone overcome their fear of failure? Right, because that so often that just gets in our way before we even have a chance to fail. Yeah, I think that's a great question too. And it's something that um, I love to kind of point out that if you can flip the script on it and really go into a situation knowing that there's a high chance of failure, but in the end, it's okay because you're just looking at it as a lesson. It takes some of the weight because failures can be weighty. I mean, it doesn't matter big or small. I, there are still times where I get frustrated because like the other day I was walking uh, through our hallway and I bashed my little toe on the on the the door. And I'm like, how in the world do I do that? <laughs> so I think in that moment, like I could be like, well, you know, I'm just clumsy. I'm this, but I think self-talk is a big part of that too. Um, but really when it comes down to it, if you can think of failures as lessons, uh, instead of like moments that, uh, are speaking more to you and who you are as a person, really it's failures are not on you. It's just the moment. And then you take a lesson from it. So I think that's a big part of it is just flipping that script on failure. Yeah. You know, doing this show brings two things to mind as it relates to our discussion. One is, I, you know, I started this show uh, not knowing anything about podcasting, but I did know that it has high SEO, and I wanted to drive traffic to my online website at the time, this over four years ago. And, uh, you know, I just thought, I'm just going to do the first show and see what happens. And I did. And, you know, it wasn't perfect. I thought, you know, oh, I'd listen to all these. And at the time, there wasn't a ton of podcasts, but I thought, oh, it's got to be, you know, great. Everything I listen to is so perfect. It's studio quality. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to get started. Uh, the other thing that brings to mind is after my first show, I had several people call me and say, hey, I loved your show about yourself. I, I'm experiencing the same challenges. Could you help me? And, and here I was presented with an opportunity to to do some consulting, and Dave Meltzer pointed that out to me. The point I'm trying to make is I started two things based on this show, and neither one of them were perfect. And you talked about uh, why perfection could be a bad thing, right? And I want—I really would love to hear your perspective on that because people neglect to, to start things because they think it's got to be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I love that point because it resonates with me too. I know when I started my podcast, uh, back in April, same thing. I didn't know what I was doing. It was one of those things where I'm going to go into it. I want it to be good, but I know I'm not going to be perfect. So, you know, I had a microphone that wasn't the best quality. I was super nervous my first episode and I, I basically bit my tongue several times. And I know like the guy interviewed, he did a great job, 
but I know that he could really feel that I was nervous. Uh, but I just didn't expect to be perfect. I think that's kind of what you're saying. I, I just went into it. And what I think is that perfection uh, really leads to inaction. And I think inaction is the true failure because if you're not trying, then to me, that is the failure. If you're trying, then you're constantly learning. And what I think a lot of people look back um, and see is that when they tried was the moments where they, when they kept trying and learning, that's when they really grew. And if you do everything right, there's just, you can learn. I'm not saying you can't, but I think there's so much more growth potential in going into something and saying, I'm not perfect. I'm going to fail. But through those failures, I'm going to figure out how not to do that again and be more successful in the future. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, I've got one. I have my headset mic, which I think is fabulous. It was a hand-me-down. But I went out and purchased one of those really expensive studio mics thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to have the best sound quality. Well, it's too perfect. It will pick yep. up the chickens across the pasture. And although that's authentic, people don't want to hear that. So sometimes, yep. you know, striving for perfection could actually be to your detriment or failure of what you're trying to do. You know, it really takes away that authenticity of who you are and what you believe and what you're trying to present. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting point too, because the more I learn about speaking and keynotes, um, I'm doing more of that now the the really good ones say that you have to be polished but not perfect yeah. and there's this fine balance and no matter what you do you don't want to be perfect because when i th i think that when people see perfection they think it's unattainable and they're like well i could never do that but through these failures i really do think it connects us and if you're raw and honest and say hey you know what i messed up in this when i this when i started as well uh it's okay i think it does encourage people so i think perfection perfectionism and when people see you as perfect it really um does not encourage them it discourages them if anything so if you can be uh open and honest and understand that failures are just a part of life and we all share in that i really do think it's really encouraging to people so i'm going to make an assumption that you and your wife uh share similar values and you guys launched this business together what is that like, and, and how many discussions uh, did you have to work out where your value propositions were at and, and how you were going to run this thing? Yeah, that's a great question, too. I, I like to tell people that running a business with your spouse is like getting married all over again. So marriage is great, but marriage can be tough. Same with running a business with your spouse. She's My wife is, is the most amazing woman I know. Um, but it's still difficult to run a business with your spouse. So it's one of those things where you have to communicate, you have to work through things. Uh, she has different work habits than I do. So we also had to learn how to really leave. Or what I learned was I can't do something at work and then expect to just leave work and let it stay there and then not let it come home. It always came home. So I really had to um, treat her with respect and dignity at work. And then that carried home as well. So it is tricky, but it is a lot like marriage. You you definitely have to baby it and learn from it. And uh, it's well worth it. It just takes a lot of work. Yeah. And communication. Correct. Communication is huge. Yeah. Which sometimes I fail at that often. So I'm still working <laughs> on that. So who's the boss? Oh, that's a good question. Um Man, I don't know how to answer that. I think uh, when it comes down to it, uh, Kendra trusts me to lead in decisions, but I really look to her for a lot of uh, wisdom and insight. But ultimately, obviously, you can't have two cooks in the kitchen. Um, but when we sit down and we talk through things and we pray together, I I fully believe and we believe together that um, I, she trusts me to to lead us in in the right direction. Yeah. What a great answer, by the way. You know, I especially like the part when you talk about praying together because, you know, we, we know who the real boss is there um, exactly. and, and and allows us to come together as a couple um, and do things like run a business. So that I congratulate you for that. Um, tell us about the book briefly, what we can expect if we were to pick it up, order it online and, yeah. and get, get into that thing. Yeah, the book will be uh, a little bit about myself uh, for the most part. And like I said, you'll hear a lot of farm analogies, but really it's uh, hopefully an encouragement to people that are either in the, the entrepreneurial fight now or they're looking to get into it 
hopefully it alleviates some of the the pressures of trying to be perfect in whatever they're starting, whether it's gardening or a business or, you know, even, you know, getting married, just understanding that we're imperfect people. Um, and we're trying to like create these perfect relationships that really uh, don't exist. So, Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully the book is an encouragement to people and, uh, it's, it's, it's an easy read and, uh, hopefully we did that on purpose and and people can digest it in, in a good way. Well, with our short attention span these days, easy reads are the best ones. <laughs> I've, got, I've got some thick books sitting in front of me that I'm I'm not sure I'll get to, but every uh, guest I've had on the show that has a book, I try to get the book and, and get through it and understand their perspective and appreciate you putting out some great work out there. You know, it, it's interesting as a coach, and, and I don't take on a lot of clients just because I... I have two kids. I spend a lot of time with them. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's so important to have a coach or have these tools available. And, um, you know, a piece of work like what you've done with your book is so critical to someone's success. So I want to thank you for doing that. And and just curious, any last words of advice to our listeners as it relates to business or working with your spouse or life in general? Yeah, well, thanks, Jim. Um, I'd, I'd say last piece of advice would be just prepare for messy and prepare to fail. Ah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, learn from it and just keep moving forward through it. I love that word, messy. Messy could be fun. Prepare for yes. it. I love, love that. Well, Justin, thank you so much for being on our show. I'll put uh, in the show notes how to get your book, where it's at, where to follow you on, on your social media platforms. And we really appreciate your time and your story today. Well, Jim, thanks for having me and thanks for all you do. Just to wrap this show up a little bit, you know, I always talk to my guests after we do the official recording. And uh, so I I turn the recorder off. I I jump on Zoom with them for a few minutes and just, you know, appreciate them coming on. But what a a great soul Justin appears to be, uh, not only in recording and probably in his book, but just my own interaction with them. So if you get a chance, pick up his book. Um, I've been so blessed to have many, many wonderful guests on this show. And in in case you're wondering, you know, when I first started my podcast, uh, I had to fight pretty hard to find guests. And, you know, of course, called every business friend and mentor I knew over the last 20 years to request their presence on my show. And they were so gracious to give me their time. And now I'm blessed to be in a position where publicists are reaching out to me on a daily basis, offering great guests. So this this is uh, to thank them. Uh, for reaching out and bringing me wonderful guests like Justin. And uh, I want to encourage all the publicists that I'm working with to continue to do so, send great guests. And if you're listening to the show and you've got any suggestions or if you're interested in being on the show because uh, you feel like you've got a story to tell, please reach out to me. You can find me through my website, livelifedriven.com. I get all the emails that come through there. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for listening to today's show. It is my pleasure and honor to interview all of the guests that have been on the Answer is Yes podcast. If you have enjoyed the show, please go on iTunes and subscribe, give a rating, or simply tell a friend about the show. We also believe in the message of our guests and the positive influence of their stories. As my own mentor and coach, David Meltzer, has taught me, spend some time every day thinking and writing about the things in your own life that you have more than enough of. You will find out how blessed we really are. Please visit my website, livelifedriven.com, for the latest updates about me and what I'm doing. Plus, I post a monthly blog about the many topics on this show. This podcast can also be found there. As I learned early on in life, what you believe is what you will achieve. Thanks, Mark Victor Hansen, and thank you, and have a great week.